the visionary founder and CEO of Masters Mark School and Training and Consultancy Services. Mrs. Anna Banjo is a seasoned professional in education, a dedicated mentor, skilled trainer, and impactful public speaker. Her passion for empowering others has driven her to nurture educators, students, and professionals across various sectors. Through her expertise in soft skills, leadership, and educational practices, she has transformed countless lives. Her contributions have earned her numerous accolades, including the Award for Leadership Excellence from the Professional Insurance Ladies Association and the Woman of the Year Award from the American Biographical Institute. These honors reflect her unwavering commitment to leadership and service, showcasing her integrity and dedication. Mrs. Anna Banjo's leadership style is marked by compassion, resilience, and a genuine desire to see others succeed. She is known for her intentional approach to achieving excellent results, inspiring her mentees to strive for excellence. Beyond her professional achievements, Mrs. Anna Banjo is a devoted wife and mother. Her family serves as her inspiration and motivation. Balancing her roles with grace, she embodies the values she instills in others, reminding us that true excellence lies in uplifting those around us. Hello, ma'am. <laughs> welcome, welcome. I think you're muted. I'm not sure that's true, but we can hear you. Okay, you are now. It's a little low, but I can hear you, but you're a little bit low. Is it better? Much better. better Thank now? you so much, ma'am. So, yes, very much better. So please, ladies and gentlemen, make welcome the mentor of our mentor, <laughs> Mrs. Okay. Right Ono now. Right you sound, sound so much better. So okay. much better, ma'am. Can you hear me? I can hear you. I can. Good. I was saying, please make welcome the mentor of our own mentor, <laughs> Mrs. Ono Banjo. And she's going to be speaking to us today as a school leader and an early childhood educator on the theme of the conference, which is Safe for Children According to Play and Recreation, Empowering Women's Leadership to Foster Resilient Children Through Play and Recreation, Shaping a Brighter Tomorrow. And I'm seriously optimistic. So if um, if you poured into Mr. Akira, I then we're here for everything. Bring, just give us everything. They look down. Well, thank you very much, man, for being here. Thank you for your time. And you have the floor. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mrs. Ayo Ayene. And I'd like to say a very big thank you to the Taiwo Akin Lami Academy for inviting me to be part of this session. And a very, very big thank you to Mrs. Oluwa Fumilayo Akin Lami, you know, for your very kind words, for being very expressive, and for delivering such a wonderful, wonderful, making a wonderful presentation. The truth to it is that I don't know what I have to present at this moment, because I believe you have touched on most of the things I probably would have planned, you know, to discuss. Um, I'm always very proud to listen to both Mr. Akilami and Mrs. Akilami to tap from their wealth of knowledge as well. The truth to life for me is that we're all co-learners and we always learn from one another, you know, engaging with one another to strive better in life. So I'm just going to go straight to my own topic in line with the theme that have been given to me and what I have done is to create a particular topic saying it's creating a responsive play to learn environment, creating a responsive play to learn environment. As rightly said by Mrs. Akinlami, as shared by Akinlami earlier on, she's talked so much on play. What I want to say to us at this time, I'm going to share a little philosophy, a philosophy with us. And while I share this, I want you as women, I want us as women, I'll say, I want us as adults, I want us as teachers, educators, I want us as those that nurture to just reflect. Take time to reflect. Take time to reflect on your understanding of this philosophy. Take time to reflect on who you are and how you got to where you are today. Now, the little philosophy I've kept, I came up with earlier on today, which had been building up over the years, 
sometimes things happen and I realize that things, you know, positions are evolving, times are evolving, situations are changing, and you're making observations on a daily basis. So you want to say to yourself, how do you equip yourself as an individual, as a person, to be equipped enough to bring up the generation that has been handed over to you? I always say to people, it's not about me. It is about nurturing the next generation. So how do you plan to hand over this button if you do not develop a philosophy that will guide you? So I'll read out a philosophy to us this evening. So I'm going to say good evening, good afternoon to everyone. And I'm happy to be here to make this presentation. And like I earlier said, I'd like to thank Taiwo Akilami Academy for inviting me to this session. I'd like to welcome everyone as we all share our thoughts and ideas together. So I believe every child should be given the opportunity to have memorable years of learning. Memorable years of learning in an environment that supports the development of each child. In an environment that supports the development of each child, creating a foundation for positive development in becoming responsible adults and responsive adults, responsible and responsive. Emphasis this evening and in the years and in the days and the years to come to support my thinking that I would always share with educators and those around me is the fact that I believe children should have positive, memorable years of learning. I'd like to ask us just for you to reflect and to have those thoughts in you. If you have to flash back as children, how did you engage? with your siblings? How did you engage with adults? How did you engage with friends within your community? How did you engage at your after school programs? How did you engage in becoming who you are today as you and in becoming who you aspire to still be? How did you engage in belonging to a community that you belong, you were before now and you are now. For some of us who are in governance, how, how? So I want to say to us, let's go back to the basics. Let's go back to the early years. For as the number of years you can recall, the level of play you had it's really all about play. We all started off with a form of play, with some activities that we'll still refer to as play. Recreation, because this is part of what we're supposed to be discussing as well. So what I'm doing is I'm trying to continue from where Mrs. Akilami stopped, but I, I can tell you, I'll probably be repeating some of the things she said. Like I said, I really don't know I have to do this part of speech as well, but then, it's all submerged together. So how did you get here? It's always important for us as adults to reflect so that we have an understanding of why our children are how they are today. Children, the standard, the key, the mighty key to the heart of a child is play. And that's the truth, particularly children in the very early years, the key to the heart of a child is play. So if you want to get the best out of a child, allow that child to explore. Allow the child to engage. Allow the child to be creative. Allow the child to express. Allow the child to be the best the child believes he or she can be at this time. And so what I want to share today is for us to be very particular about the child. 
this child, what is the objective of existence of this child? Play is said to be something that makes you happy, something that brings delight to your spirit, particularly with children. Recreation is what you do when you are not working. And for me as a child, I'm a three-year-old child. All probably I want to do at this time is to play. However, as adults, as educators, engaging with children, we always have to have behind our minds that the aspect of learning we can always build into the play activities. So what do we do as educators, as parents, as people within the community? How do we create environments that would support the children in their learning journey? Remember when I read out the philosophy, I talked about memorable times. If I sit today and I have to share thoughts, I have to share, educators always share stories. We always have stories to tell because, you know, just engaging with children, you are amazed and you just want to talk about it. So even if you want to think about yourself and reflect your beautiful times as a child, the different things you played with, it is important for us not to forget this in the nurturing of our children. Now, sometimes parents may come to us and say to you, all I see my child do is to play when I come to pick up the child from school. You as an educator, you as an informed person, it is important for us to know how to engage with parents to bring about a better understanding, which most of it Mrs. Akilami has shared with us this evening. Play is what a child loves to do. And so for me as an adult that I'd like to nurture or train the child or to support the child in learning, my best tool to support this child is to have vast knowledge or at least enough knowledge to have an understanding of the role of play in the life of this child. Children and not just children alone, actually all of us, but it starts from the foundation of life. We are nurtured, we are groomed, we are trained, we are affected by our daily experiences, daily experiences and the environment we find ourselves. And so in a school environment, it is important for us as a community, a school community, to put this in our thoughts all the time and be aware that the environment we create all the time should be an environment that will support the learning of the child. Now, I want to support the learning of each child within my system. I always love to say each child because my philosophy in life really is each child. And why am I saying each child? Each child, we have our uniqueness. There's a uniqueness to each child. So even when it comes to play and learning, how do I engage with each child to support each child's learning? Some time ago, I was actually sharing thoughts and ideas with a school owner. This is like a mentor actually to me. And she said to me, she's observed me that every time I speak, I love to say each child. And so I said to her that for me, all children in my care, they're important. They are all significant and it is important that I pay attention to each child. So it is the same nurturing I share with my colleagues at work. And that is why I appreciate what we call the emergent learning, which supports you in observing the child and knowing the strength of each child to use the strength to support the learning of each child. Is that so easy? Not necessarily, but we always find a way around it. And the best way around it is through play. 
because play is what captures the spirit, the soul, and the heart of children. It is natural. If a child sits in a corner, even if the child is very quiet, there's what you call solitary play. The child could be engaged in something very tiny and still feels very comfortable. The child could even be watching another child play. That's what you call the onlooker play. I mean, the day I read about the onlooker play, I thought to myself, oh my God, what exactly is that? So I'm just watching and I'm deriving pleasure in it. I'm watching children play and I'm deriving pleasure. And after deriving the pleasure, I could find myself in a situation where I also want to engage in the same activity. So we say to ourselves, children in a learning environment, you want to pay attention to not only the academic development of each child, you want to pay attention to the emotional development. You want to pay attention to physical development. You want to pay attention to the communication skills. And those are the aspects you have to look out for as you engage with children. And I'm still going to draw it back to what? Play activities. We have activities children love to play. It is the way that we're born. Children are born to play. <clears throat> However, how do we as educators manage this aspect of the lives of the children? How do we throw that balance to be sure that learning is taking place and play is also taking place? How do we program ourselves, fix an environment? An environment of learning is an environment that has been structured, put in place with resources, with materials, with people. I'm saying resources also includes educators, knowledgeable ones, those that have interest in the assignments, those that have interest in engaging with children, creating that environment that will make it comfortable and suitable for children to want to be in school. Yes, you have children that come in sometimes and they are crying. By the time they settle into school, they discover that, oh, school could actually be interesting, school could be fun. But how do we as adults and as educators and as parents, I always want us to know that it's a triangle. It's a triangle for learning to happen. How does learning happen? It is a triangle, the child in the center, you have educators, which is the school system, all of us all together. You have families, mothers, fathers, grandmas, all engaging with children. And you have that community that supports you as well. But the child would be what? The center. The child is the focus. So we say to ourselves, how really does learning happen? Learning would happen if we are intentional about understanding the essence of learning. Learning would happen if we understand the tools required for children to learn. It will happen when we as adults, as educators, as parents, as the community, we have an understanding of how to communicate with the children. Learning would happen when we create an environment that is supportive of the children's well-being when we create an environment that is safe and secure, when we create an environment that brings to mind to each child that I belong, a sense of belonging. Learning would happen when I allow or encourage children to be expressive. Now we go back to play. How do we marry play with a sense of belonging? How do we marry play with communication, being expressive? How do we marry play with safety and protection of the children? How do we marry play with an understanding of our roles as educators, as a school community, of our roles as parents, and of our roles as community close to us as a school. How do we marry play to make this suitable for children to learn, to engage and be ready to learn? As families, we know it is important that we always engage, give the school feedback. It's, it's, it's a beautiful thing to do because we all have to collaborate 
so we can get the best out of the children. So if you come to school or you sign the daily reports, you have what you call the daily reports, you give the school feedback, the school gives you feedback. In those, what are those things your children love to do? What are those activities? Because playing those activities are part of play. Activities will engage them in a lot of play. So what are those things they love to do that will support them? For instance, numeracy. You have a three-year-old child. The child is not interested. She's also interested. I mean, for heaven's sake, I'm three years old. I'm just three years old. Why, why are you stressing me? How do you engage marry play with the learning of the child? The different activities that would be appropriate for that particular age. You could even be climbing down the staircase and you're counting together. You could be doing anything and you could be having lunch. Snack time, lunch time is also another time you have an opportunity to engage with the child. Particularly if you feel that this child has a struggle in a particular line. Numeracy, literacy, you have different times you could engage, but in a play, fun like manner. I recall, I'm going to recall one of my nephews years ago, because we would always say to them, don't play with no guns, you know? I mean, like, doo -doo 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 -doo. you don't want them to engage in stuff like that. I recall one day, he had a cookie on him. Since he wouldn't be giving the gun, the play gun to play with. You know what he did? He ate the cookie into a shape of a gun, and he held it this way. That was what he could do, because that was what his brain wanted to do at that time. But maybe us as adults, we could have had a conversation with him to let him understand why to have an understanding, that is a place of communication. And then the child will go for that to ask you questions, but the child wants to play with the gun. So I want to play with the gun. Why would you not encourage me to play with this particular toy? There's an understanding because you don't want to fill the child's mind up with shooting and all that. God granting us grace to know how to express ourselves and to bring up, apply wisdom in making such explanations to the understanding of the children. And so we say to ourselves, the environment that would make a child learn, how learning happens, I just want to reemphasize that, is the fact that the child wants a sense of belonging. And so if I have play activities and I cannot play with it because other children are engaging, playing with those activities, how do I manage to tell the child, when A is done with this, it would be your turn. After this, it will be your turn. And so the child is learning, learning life skills. You know, when I wrote this philosophy, it occurred to me that we have dysfunctional adults sometimes, a good number of times because of our foundation. I crack jokes sometimes with us as adults. When I see adults, some of us display and do certain things, I say, hey, we're just acting like deprived adults. You know, we've been deprived of certain things. I mean, we, we played as kids, and then suddenly age has passed, and you can't do this. And so you find yourself in some environments, you just want to act a bit funny and silly. But that's actually a joke and fun aspect of it. But in the real sense of it, a number of adults have been, de they, they were deprived. And as such, they grew not understanding the essence of play. And so you get irritated when a child, we, we hear things like, you're always very messy. I'm not saying we should indulge children in being messy, but I will say to you that this has to do with the stage. If a two year old child is always messy, for heaven's sake, there's nothing wrong in that. How do you manage? Because the child needs support. Nothing stops a two-year-old that is feeding himself or herself. To, nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. But a number of times, because we want to save ourselves from the mess, we disallow the children to be messy. Children can be messy. A two-year-old should be messy. When I'm feeding myself, I'll be messy. And when I'm done, mom or dad or my teacher should be there to support me you see, I, I, I said to even the educators, you don't have to feed a child. No, allow the child do. do I heard some of the Mr. Kingham is always saying, allow the child to do what the child can do. 
the truth is that the children would feed themselves. They'll just be messy about it. They have whatever they have to use their aprons, and it would go on there. But however, how do we protect them from, being, from doing the extreme when we're there? Children should never be left unsupervised. So when you are there as an adult, as a support person, but if you are, because if you are not there, the child can also trip from the chair. If you are not there, you know, a lot of times, because we are multitasking, you are probably trying to do something else. I want to say something to us with children. It takes just a second, just one little second. My nephew at the age of, I think it was four or thereabouts. And all the grandmother wanted to do at that time, was, because she said she just wanted to lock the door. He was on the balcony and they were all set to go on a trip. And she said all she needed to do was to lock, the door we we're talking about was just right behind her. And she turned her back to lock the door before she knew the child was downstairs. You know what I mean by down? He had tripped over the railing. Because children explode, children are inquisitive. They have inquisitive minds, their minds Will go for he probably just he probably just saw a news that I don't know what he saw, but he probably just saw something that caught his attention and he looked. And in the process of looking, there was an accident. So, what am I saying to us as educators, as parents, as adults, to all of us? Let's take that extra care in paying more attention, being there, being involved, being supportive of whatever the children are engaged in doing. And for school systems, we always have what you call the school policy. I believe all organizations even have policies. So you have to go by the policies. You have the child protection policy. And thank you also to um, Mr. Taiwa Kinlami, because I recall that one of our staff, you know, was encouraged to take a program there. And that also helped us a lot in putting up a proper structure, you know, with um, the child protection policy. And so it is important for us as a school, as a system, to be particular. And then, of course, what will be the process? What's the process when an accident happens? What's the process when we fail to comply? What is the process? You know, so it is important for us to put up a structure that we will genuinely follow. Sometimes it's a struggle. However, it is important for us to do the right thing because we have generation we have that next generation we're nurturing sometimes we are so busy and you know being an educator is not a simple task at all i appreciate and i know i tell you know sometimes you are home and you can't even think if you look if you look at <laughs> if you look at the instagram sometimes during vacations our teachers are so excited not teachers in this part of the world they don't everywhere they're like look it will give me a bit of time to breathe. So sincerely to all educators that are on ground today, I want to say to all educators and school owners, you're doing a great job. To parents, we're doing great jobs. We're doing great jobs being there for the children to give them that sense of living, the sense of existence. What I just want to encourage us today is for us to value what instruments we would use to genuinely support their learning. What instruments would we put in place to genuinely support them to be emotionally balanced? What instruments would you put in place to support them to have the physical development? Sometimes you discover that, oh, a child does not love to run. You can still engage the child, support the child, encourage the child, but then identify what aspect of play, outdoor play does this child, would this child love to be part of? I have. I'm going to say, and this has, doesn't have to do with physical play alone. For instance, role play like Mrs. Akinlami mentioned. It is important. Some children may not display that they have the abilities, the skills. That is why they're in school. That is why people do audition in any way, even as older people. So you want to support some children that you feel that if this child continues this way, it would come up as a confident adult. This child may not come up as a responsive adult if the child is not careful. So it is in our position as adults, as people, as families to support the children, children in our families, in our communities, in our society, when we find ourselves 
playing the roles in government. We should be there available for the children. Play is not something you can throw away from children.